good morning, everybody. Uh, let me first start by saying that I'm delighted to be here and I am thankful to the uh, organizing committee for having invited me and in particular to Paul Prindler who has been just so supportive from the very beginning. I have to admit that when I was first asked to, um, to give a keynote today, I was a little bit hesitant. Uh, I've never taught an online course nor have I taught a blended learning course. I took one MOOC and I almost didn't finish it. And I don't tweet, I lurk. And I thought maybe I'd be an outlier here. But then I, the theme itself of the conference is one of uh, capacity building. And that's what we do. That's what basically what I've been doing for the past uh, 12 or 13 years as a faculty developer and as a founder for the Center for Learning and Teaching at the American University in Cairo. So let me give you a little bit of a background or, or a context of, because context is everything. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about our university. Okay, there we are. Uh, it's a small university, very small compared to the numbers I've been hearing around. And we, as you see, we've, uh, it's a beautiful campus. We've just moved to it in 2008. And it is an, in, it was founded about 100 years ago. We are going to be celebrating our centennial pretty soon. And it's an independent, non-profit uh, institution that is uh, of the liberal arts um, education or, or approach. We have a few uh, professional arts, professional um, schools, but we essentially adhere to the liberal arts philosophy. And uh, I mean, you can read the statistics for yourself. You see the numbers are, are small, although I don't quite believe this faculty student ratio. Uh, it's real, but it's, uh, <laughs> there's something off there. Uh, we have a diverse faculty body, and uh, most of it are Egyptian, the majority of Egyptian, but a quarter of them are Americans, and the rest are uh, other nationals. Now, within the spectrum of the from face to face to online, we fall three fifths of the way. Uh, we're mostly face to face with a lot of technology enhanced since the last 10 years, if you wish. Uh, but you know, the, you know, there's, it's been an uphill battle to go further, and it's only the last two and a half years, two years actually, that we've started the blended learning program. Uh, we also have partnered, collaborating with the Arab MOOC platform, Idrak. I don't know if you're familiar with it, but they have um, partnered with edX. Uh, that is the, um, uh, the Queen Rana Foundation in Jordan, found, you know, decided that 80% of the Arab world do not speak English. And so they're shut out completely from the MOOC experience. And so the, the, uh, the, the uh, rationale behind it is that we wanted to make MOOCs available to the Arab world in Arabic and they're, they're doing a fairly good job. Uh, we are supporting the pedagogical, we, I mean by the Center for Learning and Teaching, is supporting the pedagogical design and assessment of MOOCs that are produced at the American University in Cairo. And we're proud to say that the first Arabic MOOC was given by a professor at, the, at, at our university. And you can see them here. Um, I'm going to start off with a quote. The question is no longer whether online education is as good as face-to-face -face instruction, but rather how to prepare and support faculty. And that's what I'm going to be talking mostly about. How to prepare and support faculty in the online environment and ensure that students achieve important learning outcomes, whether they study online or face-to-face. -face. Um, what are the role of teaching centers like the one we have? And that's the gist of my, my, my talk. And to answer that question, I'm going to consider two frameworks. One of them is this framework that was developed by the European Commission for creating what they call sustainable learning environments that allow for innovative pedagogical practices using ICT. And this is the, how the framework looks like. It has eight uh, categories, uh, and each category is made of building blocks teaching processes, practices, learning practices, assessment, content curricula, infrastructure, connectedness, leadership and values, organization. And out of these eight, there are 
five of them that have to do with faculty development. So it's not a simple matter, it's a, a rather long list. And if you look a little closer at what these building blocks are, and again, I have to turn around to read because I can't read that far, you're going to have to foster multiple modes of, of thinking, foster softer skills, apply practices of social inclusion and equity when you're teaching, uh, recognize, monitor quality, learn across disciplines, engage through social networks, etc., etc. I mean, you can keep on reading, but each one of them is quite, it's quite a responsibility. And when we start teaching, when we, you know, we go, we finish with our PhDs and we go into the classrooms, I mean, we're not prepared for any of these, or most faculty are not prepared for that. And so uh, the job, essentially, of a faculty developer is to help out. Now, if I talk about online learning, I think it's even more complex. Uh, I've been using the same one, I, met, I can tell you, I have, na I have not uh, you know, talked to Joyce about that, but I, you know, I'm using the word, the wicked problem. Online learning, and then learning in general, is a wicked problem. And for those of you who are not familiar with the term, wicked problems are ones that are unique and contextual. They're problems which solutions are one-shot solutions which are neither right nor wrong, just better or worse. They're problems which it is hard to measure success and which are never solved indefinitely. And so I'm going to add another layer here. And that is another framework by George Siemens. And that framework is in a, um, in a book. They, just, they have it online for free. And it's, it's called Preparing for the digital, the digital University. And he's showing you the various, the variables that have to go in when you're preparing for online learning. And again, look, just looking at the map, it's rather, it's, it, it shows you, it highlights the complexity of it. You have the instructor you know, who has to be highly digital, uh, he has to have high digital literacy, et cetera, et cetera, instructional strategies, institutional adoption, course design, media, content, learner, et cetera. So again, we, we're dealing with variables that are each one of them in itself, I think, is a, is, is a complexity that we can reflect about on things. And so is online learning, is learning a wicked problem? And the answer is yes. You have here the input of what you want to achieve. You have so many variables. What are the solutions? Well, you can have one, two, and three, and you have to choose which solution is the best for the context that you are dealing with. So solutions are contextual. There's no doubt about it. And that is what we have to deal. We have to deal with faculties that are different, with students that are different, and prepare them for the different disciplines. So I'm going to use, I'm going to start off, you know, I mean, you're very familiar probably with this, this uh, uh, diff Rogers diffusion curve that talks about, you know, the early adopters and, and how we try to get everybody around the mean. And I contend that we have to think about this, this innovation on two, le on two levels the technology adoption on one hand and the pedagogical adoption on the other hand, the pedagogical innovation. And when the two of them, I don't think are the same. And if I have to superimpose two curves, I would say that the curve for technology adoption, at least as far as the faculty I'm being, you know, I've been used to, is, is pretty steep. Faculty are probably more um, uh, uh, ready to go ahead with pedagogical innovations, but the, the, the technology adoption is a little bit more confusing. So uh, what does re research tell us about all of that? And I'm going to use here uh, the research uh, of the uh, Horizon Report, the New Media Consortium Horizon Report that comes out every year, the EDUCOR Center for Applied Research, and the Campus Computing Project. And this is what they have to say. Um, very simply, <laughs> something that we all know, that the, there are many challenges that uh, impede the higher education technology adoption. But the one challenge is a simple one, very simple, that people resist change. They don't, you know, faculty do not. We had to uh, migrate from WebCT to Blackboard of numbers years ago, and it was, it was like pulling teeth and they were not very happy, but we had to do it because WebCT was, was locking down. So resistance to change is a very human thing, but if you look at it specifically as far as online and technology adoption, well, research tells us one of the biggest problems is the low di digital fluency of faculty and the resistance to change to teaching online. 
And research tells us uh, uh, that the reasons are complex. And probably if you, you know, you probably, it's, it sounds, you know, it's, it's, it's common sense. There's why? Well, number one, they can't keep up, they feel they can't keep up with the pace of development. They're changing all the time and you have apps and all the time, different uh, uh, technologies are pop popping up and, and it is quote unquote disruptive. And the biggest, the biggest stumbling block is time. Faculty are always in need for more time. Uh, if I go back to the diffusion curve over here, and, uh, and you have this ch the famous chasm that we have, most faculty will feel that they are at the extreme left, and they really should start somewhere as an early adopter, but in fact they're too late and they should have been already in, as a, as in, in, the, in the mean. So the net result is that they just keep doing what they would have been always doing, that it's been working, why should they change? Now I'm going to give you the example of our faculty, and again, we have at the, uh, they're lucky, they have at their fingertips a number of, of technologies that they can use, and also the support that goes with it. But again, what you have in the middle, these question marks are also sometimes there, what should I use, and, and I don't have to, have to be bothered to learn something that you're going to, that's going to be changed next day. Uh, I have an answer to that, and the answer I found really in what uh, I've s I saw on a TED talk one day, uh, Barry Schwartz wrote a book called The Paradox of Choice. And what he says is that as we face more options, we become overloaded. That choice, in fact, does not liberate us, it debilitates. And so the net result, you get decision paralysis, and you want to remain as it is. You don't, you don't want to change. The status quo is exactly what you, you know, you want to keep doing what you've been doing. And uh, I think that's very true. I, I, I actually, I felt uh, the same way when I first came to the United States as a graduate student. I mean, back in Cairo, I was used to two coffees, the Turkish coffee and the Nescafe. And I go there and there's a zillion things on the, on the shelf and, and you really are confused. And today with Starbucks, it's even more confusing than ever. So the, sometimes you just, you know, you just keep doing, you just, you know, just keep drinking your Nescafe because you're used to it and you don't want to change. There's not much risk in doing so. Uh, another reason that research tells us faculty resist is they are not convinced, not totally convinced, that technology makes a difference. And maybe they're right because technology does not make it unless you use it properly. But they, so uh, that's another thing. And then the other thing is the reward system. And we all know that research is in fact more valued and a favor, the reward system favors research. So if they have to teach, like in our case, three courses, do their research, and there are a number of committees they have to go to, well, you know, to, if teaching, if it's not rewarding, you have to spend so much time on it, that gets relegated a little bit further than the rest. Okay, so we've seen what faculty, in a sense, how they feel. What does research tell us about the learners? And here I'm going to rely on the EDUCORS Center for Applied Research, the, you know, the, the, the reports that they have every year. They've been tracking technology and they've been tracking the, the, the responses of learners and, and, and recently the responses of faculty. And uh, in the last two, my, the, wh what I'll be sharing with you is the, some of the research, some of the results in, of 2014 and 2013. Now, at first, you know, most of the studies were done uh, specifically on American uh, campuses. But the last one, the tw 2014 one, was they got 75,000 respondents of students. And um, it was carried in 213 campuses. But the interesting thing, they had 15 different countries, students from 15 different countries responding, and faculty too. And I have to say that the uni my university happened to be one of those 15 countries. So there is, it's, it's a, I'm not saying that it's, it's, it reflects anything, because, uh, but it's, it's, it's a little bit more diversified than just the United States. So the research tells us simply, that students prefer blended learning environments. And more specifically, these are the numbers. Even undergraduate students, 75% of undergraduate students prefer partially online and uh, as to you know face to face. Uh, they also like the, the completely online, but they're not, I mean, they're a real small minority. If you go to the adult population, as expected, more, more of them like, uh, you know, prefer 
the uh, adult, but the, but the majority of them still prefer the partially, uh, the whatever you call blended learning. Uh, as far as their perspective of the value of technology, well, the majority of them think that it's going to help them in the workplace, that it's going to help them with their academic outcomes. So it is a fav they have a favorable outlook. What about faculty? Faculty, in that same survey, we had 17,000 respondents. So it's, it's, a, it's a good, it's a, nice, it's a nice group. And from 13 countries. And what they have to say is the following. They recognize that online learning opportunities can promote access. They give you that. But they are still more reserved in their expectations for online courses to improve outcomes. So they're still, they're still skeptical about what is going to happen. Uh, however, something more interesting, if you look at it a little bit further, you know, the, for those fact, first of all, there are about one third of the respondents uh, have taught an on uh, have taught an online class. Now, to me, that is that is a pretty high percentage. I don't know if maybe those that answered the, the surveys are the ones that they were more prone to answer because they've, they've taught online, but that is 30% of, or 33% having taught an online class was surprising. But what is even more surprising is that those that have taught online, 62% say that online learning will lead to pedagogical breakthrough. So those that try it have liked it. It's those that don't try it that say that really are much more uh, suspicious. Okay, so how can we motivate faculty to try it? And this is what the research say. And again, the, it seems like it's a common sense results. Uh, evidence that students would benefit because, you know, um, after all, we are there in the, in the, in the profession because we like, you, we like teaching, we like we like mentoring, we, like, we would be happy that our students are learning. So if we have evidence that that is happening, that would be more. The release time to, res to design courses, that's something that administrators have to listen to because they, most administrators think that it doesn't take time either to design or to teach online, at least the, the ones I'm dealing with. Uh, the confidence that technology would, you, would work as planned, today I had I backed out my, my presentation a number of times because I'm always suspicious that that may not happen also. And a better understanding of teaching and learning relevant technologies. So th these are the four main motivators that would get faculty to uh, use more technology and also teach online. Okay, now for the third part of it, what are the best practices for teaching online, for online learning? And how does that tie in with what we should be doing with faculty as faculty developers? Uh, and here I'm relying on the work, or on the report that Siemens and his collaborators have written, the one I just mentioned uh, earlier, and it's available online. They just, they just published it online on, in February. Uh, and it's really a very useful report. If you have a chance, have a look at it. And specifically, they in for this particular case, they've synthesized 32 scholarly works, and this is what they have to say about best practices for online. Not they have to say, I mean, what the report with the 32 works says. Number one, the courses should be well designed with interactive and engaging content. That the online discussion, and online discussions are extremely important, that online discussions should be structured with clear guidelines and expectations. That the instructor should monitor and facilitate these discussions. Now I hate to, you know, to say that to some of the people that were telling me that they have 700 students online or 1,000 students online. That they should facilitate student collaboration. That they should provide individualized, timely, and formative feedback. And again, all of these are best practices for face-to-face. -face. It doesn't have to be, the, some of it, is, ha, it has to do with, with online specifically. That there should be mechanism to, ref, to prompt reflection and self-assessment. John Dewey said that there is no learning without reflection. So we should be giving our students the room for that. That flexible deadlines, of course, should exist. And that instructors should continuously monitor student progress then they should be continuously involved. Now, that, that really is, a, as far as I'm concerned, a very long list and a, a very demanding list for, for faculty that are teaching online. And the conclusion that George Siemens says is that this implies a more complex role for the instructor in online environment, which we know, but it's really more complex than even we think. 
and the further research might be on, on how to support instructors to teach more effectively. Then the, so how do we deal with these large numbers and, and at the same time honor these best practices? So summarizing, uh, the research says, importance of learner-centered design, importance of interactivity, a key role for the faculty in delivering those online courses, which essentially means that we have to have well-trained faculty. And I really am very reluctant to use trained because the word trained, I mean, it's, I know it's, it's used quite often, but training means implies that once it's done, then we have somebody that can, there's a, a superb teacher or a teacher all right. Now we know that teaching doesn't work that way. Teaching is a, is a continuously evolving and, and a very personal experience. And I, I continue saying it's a wicked problem because it, it adapts to every situation that you have that is at hand. And so I think, yes, uh, training or, or going through workshops or, go, or doing professional development is a beginning. And then we learn, we learn as we go on. It's, it's, a, it's a long life um, endeavor. Okay, so how do we prepare for faculty for online? Um, my experience, I think, is to have to have an, an institutional unit that is really responsible for that, whatever you want to call it, a teaching and learning center. I'm quoting over here, he's talking about institutional centers that, for teaching, learning, and technology. In our university, I think they decided for that, for, for even for the face-to-face -face faculty, that we had needed something like that, and this was the center that I was responsible to found. Uh, for those of you that are interested, there are faculty development progs uh, programs that are of very different, uh, many different models, and each model should satisfy the, the context that you're in. There are different approaches, and I'm going to talk about three of them very broadly. There is the pr approach in which uh, an institution would rely on those long ranges, those early adopters, to mentor, to, uh, to help, to, to uh, work with, to collaborate with faculty and to get them on board to help them uh, actually do what they have to do. That is not, that's not a good model because it's not sustainable. The minute the lone rangers disappear, the, the, the program or the, uh, would, would crumble. There is the other approach which is called the boutique approach. And that boutique approach is, is very much what we do. And that is one in which there is a one-to-one -one support for faculty. It doesn't mean that all our dealing with faculty is one-to-one. -one. We have workshops, we're dealing with, you have learning communities, a whole bunch of things. But if they need one-to-one -one support, we are there. We are there for redesigning, we're there for assessing, we're there for a number of things that the uh, individual faculty from all disciplines could find support. This is very satisfying to us. It's very satisfying to the faculty developer and to the, to the uh, faculty at large, but it is not scalable. Uh, our university, as you can tell, you know, we, have, we have about 500, 600 faculty members. We can still juggle and we're able to do that and, and, and we're getting pretty, you know, pretty tight at doing that, but it is not scalable. So if you really want to do something bigger, then you have to use the systemic approach in which you have to do capacity building to support large numbers of faculty. And here you have the, you know, the quality versus the scalability, you know, the quality. Do we maintain quality and, and reach scalability? And that's, that's uh, something that needs to be juggled and, and depends on the context. The three, the, the areas that need support in general is faculty development, content development, assessment, and here, I th as far as we're concerned, we talk about formative assessment, not evaluative ones, and I'll explain why in a little while. The learner needs support and the infrastructure. Uh, for institutions that are leaders in the field, they get all of these fives in under one roof, one administration, so there is no overlap and there is no, um, well, there's no overlap. In our case, we essentially the center deals with those three uh, parts to it. The faculty development, the, the technology integration assessment. And for those who, who work for us only, because we can't afford it very much, we, we, have, we get le learner support. So if they do some kind of innovation, we go in there and we train their students, we get them on board and so on. So it's not something that um, the faculty has to, to worry too much about. 
we also have another program that that lends some train that does some training for for students in the library. Uh, so I I'm, I have to say something. But I mean, I'm not going to end and not say something about the center itself because some of what we're doing you may find useful. I we were inspired a lot. I'm inspired a lot by some of the things that I saw in other centers when we and I started you know thinking about what's going to what how to to adapt what I've seen to our center. And so I think it is useful to share these things. And um, typically, what we de what the way we the main um, pillars that we, uh, we, uh, we, 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 we work on are technology, pedagogy first, <laughs> technology integration and assessment. And it is really as one part. It's a holistic approach where one depends on the other and we don't do it independently. Uh, we also do a lot of outreach. We started doing that a few numbers a few years ago, you know, nationally, uh, regionally, and internationally. We are part of a consortium of, uh, you know, liberal education style uh, universities that are outside the United States. They're all over Europe and in Asia and also in the Middle East. And we do collaborate a lot with them and exchange ideas and and uh, and uh, support one another when when we we need to. Uh, the, the, main, the main gist of it is that we, we give opportunity for faculty for collaboration, for professional development, for experimentation, and we do it usually incrementally. And what works, we institutionalize. And one of the very first thing we did is, so, is, a, is a program called the, the Student Technology Assistant Program. I have to hurry up a little bit here, I'm getting too close. And it was extremely useful. And, 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 and by summarizing, we just use our students, graduates and undergraduates, we train them, and they are the ones that go one-on-one -on -one working with faculty. And faculty love it because they can call them at any time of the day. They can go to their offices and they work with them. And they work on small things, you know, just simply training on the LMS if that's what they want, or actually on larger projects where they're doing um, learning objects. And this is one example over here. Sh somebody, uh, you know, giving feedback, she says, anyways, like I said, I'm overwhelmed with all the work, the work Sandy and the STAs have done. I honestly had a hard time sleeping last night. My mind was rushing with all the ways I could use this. So again, thank you so much, Sandy and the SCAs. I know the project has mushroomed, and just when you think you're done, I come up with more things. But thanks to your hard work, the final product is going to rock. Yippee. This was a history professor who, was, who designed a very elaborate timeline interactive on Islamic movements in the last few centuries and, and was very successful. We have workshops, and this just gives you an idea of the attendance to the workshops. Uh, it, it, uh, we have a, a fairly, um, you know, fairly healthy attendance. Some of it, sometimes it goes up very much like in that case, simply because we had Eric Mazur visiting and he gave a couple of workshops and we had some visitors. And this year also it's going to go up because we have many international events going on. We do formative assessment activities and it's one of those that is extremely useful and extremely popular. We started off, as you can tell, very timidly. I had no idea if faculty would want us to go in there and give them feedback on how they teach, to go to the classrooms, to go and so on. But it took off, it took off very, very quickly and it's really, it works very well. And again, I'm quoting here a professor of engineering who has just designed a blended learning course and we went in there and during the mid semester to give him feedback and he said I can't thank you enough for such wonderful support the surveys really helped me further improve my offering in the second half of the term feedback from the students was really encouraging and constructive uh, we have a newsletter it's called the new talk talk it's a bi-weekly newsletter and again when we started it 13 years ago we didn't know if it was going to continue keeping the momentum. It has kept the momentum, and we are, uh, we are still at it. Uh, and this year, we're trying something new. We have certificates that are meant for focus tracks, and we g they are called certificates of participation. It's not a certificate that you can go ahead and teach, I mean, and, and, and can train, but it's a certificate of participation, and they are the tracks are assessment, active learning, web-enhanced learning, course design, and community-based learning. Uh, a year and a half ago, uh, we have another t different type of certificate that is the blended learning certificate, and that is much more demanding. 
uh, faculty that want to teach blended learning have to do it, have to take that certificate. It's a six week certificate that, um, that is given online, partly as a blended form. And so I'm going to end up here, but very quickly, I cannot end up without, oh, we also have, sorry, we also have faculty associates this year that are, work as a bridge between us and the departments. They are very useful, they're very happy to be part of it and we're very excited to have them. And I can't end up without sharing with you the team that makes up the Center for Learning and Teaching. They are a great team. Uh, somebody saw that picture and told me, boy, they're so young. But of course, are they comparing it to me? <laughs> yes, they are very young, but they're very, uh, dedicated professionals, they're passionate, they, are, they, they take their, their own professional development very seriously, and I, uh, I'm very thankful for that. So I'm ending with a final word, and here I am borrowing a, um, a quote from Dr. Primrose Turacha. And again, I'm reminding you that we really have to contextualize online learning. The world has still parts of it that have no access to electricity, no ICT, prohibitive costs, and therefore there is still need to stick with the combination of online and print for sustainability if that is the context that you are working with. And so I thank you very much and I thank uh, the organization for having gotten, invited me for this keynote and um, that's, that's what I had to say. Thank you.